terms of priority, you know, <coughs> I suspect maybe all of our priority is the shopping center because it's probably the most glaring, the most glaring need is to kind of do what we can do to get them in compliance as far as um, an image of where that needs to be. I'm not sure, I guess I don't really totally understand how you guys go about your business, but I'm not sure how we can get that from where we are now there by property inspection. It's certainly going to help in terms of the appearance of the building, but you know, where I, where I want to see the shopping center is where you go by and it looks nice and it's well landscaped and it's full of businesses. You know, that's, that's where we are. Right, that, that is not necessarily a function of uh, enforcement of a... Of oh, I understand that. So if, so he, so if he wants to know what we want it to look like, that's what we want it to look like. It, it's not a function of enforcement, but also as representatives of the community, we now have a vested interest in collectively figuring out what kind of businesses could survive or prosper in there. You know, if you if you go through the mental list of businesses that are successful in strip shopping centers nowadays, you find typically none of the national chains, unless it's a bright new shiny fancy one with a Walmart at one end and a Macy's at the other. So the, the old traditional strip shopping centers tend to be independently owned businesses. They tend to be businesses that provide service not on a regional basis, but on a local community basis. And you know, a lot of the spaces are already occupied by these, visit, these businesses. You can get your hair taken care of. You know, there's uh, a bank. There's a variety of local services. But there may be other local, potentially locally owned businesses. One of the obvious things that isn't represented there in the proportion it normally is nowadays in those kind of shopping centers is uh, some kind of local donut store, bagel store, pizza, fast food, whatever. Usually shopping centers of that size may have a couple of places where there is some form of food that the people living around about don't want to go all the way to the highway because everybody lives within reasonable distance of the, the big interchanges with all the McDonald's, Wendy's, and so on. So you don't get those businesses coming into this kind of a shopping center, but you do get locally owned, owner-operated businesses. Any input you got? You guys go around and you see a lot of business. Yeah, right. a lot I, of was looking, I was thinking, okay, in the back of my mind, tell everyone if I notice something that seems to survive, seems to be thriving somewhere else, because then she can work on ways of enticing, encouraging uh, the entrepreneurs to come in. Andrew, I'd say for me that I have three priorities. One would be. Uh, the shopping center, two would be any vacant structures in the community, and third would be multifamily dwellings. Well, I think, uh, and my know, concern on multifamily dwellings is like safety. That should be at the top. Just rental properties in general, I think. Uh, I think for the most part, the, you know, the, uh, the live in. Cell phone structures, or most of them, in pretty good shape. There are some exceptions, but you know, the rental properties. I think where we have a lot of our, a lot of our problems. So the rental properties, specifically rental properties on the main thoroughfares coming up. You know, on, on the ones on, on uh, Cromwell, the ones on Farragut, the ones on Damon. Um, you know, those, those where you got to got to get off there to get somewhere else in the village. You know, if we're going to prioritize. Them. Do that first, and then get them in, get in at all the little side streets and everything else. But everything's been covered. Yeah, I've, I've had three phone calls from residents, different residents, in the past month, and I've been gone two weeks for that past month, uh, complaining about trash. This is the shopping center, but trash in general about the community. And they were saying that, especially when there's big events like Oktoberfest or anything that we know is going to bring in extra people and so on. 
we need bigger trash containers put out for those along the shopping center and everywhere. One resident has taken to keeping a box in the trunk, which is sad, um, and when she comes to the shopping center, we'll pick up some trash and throw it into her box and take it away because she's embarrassed by the, the appearance of the community and is concerned that she not be in trouble or get a ticket or get arrested for taking away trash from... <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I, I told her I'd go back for it if, if that happened, but it, there is a big concern about the, the appearance of trashiness. <coughs> and also trash being put out too early all, you know, in the residential areas and so on. And I have a feeling that that's not your jurisdiction, the garbage putting it out and taking it in. We will, we'll issue notices. Okay. And Excuse so, me, I'm sorry. We will issue notices. All right. I just need somebody to tell me what day the trash is picked up. Tuesday night. Tuesday night. Yeah. So Tuesday, Tuesday pickup. Wednesday, 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 Wednesday pick morning pickup. Pick so the window is 3 p.m. Tuesday to 11 p.m. We modified it. We modified it. I think it might be six. He's saying six. Six p.m. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So people that put out mattresses on Saturday yeah, or Sunday, and all kinds of things. Eleven p.m. They wash. So trash is a big deal, you know, and um, it's it's a priority of mine. It's also a priority that I keep getting these phone calls about, too. Okay. Yeah, what, I got an email this week um, from Gaylord Poe. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you know who he is. Uh, <coughs> as you know, IBI had the privilege of providing electrical inspection service to people of Green Hills since the inception of Green Hills. The level of electrical safety and service present in your community is a result of many years of teamwork between Green Hills and IBI all in the interest of public safety. Since we are funded by those we regulate and not the community we serve, we continue to be an excellent value to your community. We will we work seamlessly with NC, NIC and other jurisdictions and look forward to the relationship. Uh, unless you direct us otherwise, we will continue to send our reports electronically. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, you got a good right working relationship with them. We, is this kind of seamless? Tell, tell me about that. Um, <laughs> trying to be diplomatic here. When we started, we concentrated on building departments and also electrical, where there wasn't any electrical. We made a strategic decision not to pursue, not to specifically pursue electrical permits and inspections in metropolitan Cincinnati because it seemed to us like the pie was big enough that we didn't have to go rock the boat in the Cincinnati metropolitan area. Uh, throughout time, typically, as we've got new customers, they have come to us either straight off or after two or three years. They seem to prefer the consistency of service we provide. As far as the seamlessly is concerned, there's been some changes in the Ohio building code, the last version of the administrative section. The administrative section requires a building official to approve, review and approve plans and issue permits. That's caused some contention because um, in a number of communities, building, quote, permits are being issued by a private entity without the building official approving them. The inspections are being done and the certificates of completion are being issued to Duke Power or whoever without the involvement of the building official. So, we are in two communities where that's still, that we're involved in, we aren't comfortable with that because Ohio administrative code You feel says like it's contrary to the administrative part of the Ohio. Yeah, the Ohio administrative code says mm -hmm. the building official has to approve it, has to issue the permit, and has to issue the certificate. <coughs> Yvonne, 
you feel like that's something we've got to still address or? The issue of IBI and MSC? Yes. I, you know, I, I think we want to keep our eye on it because, uh, you know, the other issue in my experience is that, especially when you're talking about larger projects, we have to send our people to a, another entity, then another entity, IBI and NIC. NIC is doing the whole thing. There, there's, it's a one-stop shop for mm -hmm. them. Um, so that's, that's one advantage I can see. Okay. You well, let's just keep an eye on it. I don't think well, what is our relationship with IBI? Do we have a contract with them? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think most communities in Hamilton County yeah, have to have a contract. Yeah. I, IBI started 180 <coughs> years ago doing electrical inspections, so they probably predate the building code per se. And the tradition in the southwest Ohio area has been that building departments such as Hamilton County, Cincinnati, mm -hmm. don't have electrical plan reviewers or inspectors. They just say, go to IBI and take care of it. And once they get a final inspection ticket from IBI, they put that into the records that the building is electrically safe. So that's been the custom and practice for 100 years. In parallel, the state of Ohio over the years has introduced and strengthened the building code, and the two are incompatible at the moment. Is there anything IBI does or can do that you can't do? I don't see any reason maintaining another contract with somebody who's this duplication. I don't, I don't think, you know, I want a residence staff to deal with two different entities to, for a project. Rather than for two, and I've also been involved in some projects where, you know, the electrical permit was holding everything up. The person couldn't occupy the building, so you know that's under their control, and obviously they have control over that as opposed to two different entities. Well, this guy apparently thinks he still has a contract. He must have a oh, and, and automatically does, renewing yes. contract, so we should probably cancel that. Right. Me? I believe it's a six-month um, termination. I just saw it. I wanted to raise the, raise the issue. I thought I knew what the no, issue was, was, but I, I wasn't trying to make you say something bad about somebody uh, else. Or, I mean, you if you want to put on my, I'll put on my dancing shoes and my dog and pony show and tell you why NIC is a heck of a sight better than anybody else, but <laughs> I don't want to insult your intelligence. <clears throat> what typically happens is that the communities that decide to go with us for everything, because we don't, we don't have any communities where we only do electric. We have communities where we do everything or back up everything for employee building inspectors. Well, you don't do plumbing inspections, do you? We can, but we don't in this <coughs> part of the because, again, what's evolved in Ohio over the years, in southwest Ohio, plumbing can be uh, regulated by the health department or by the building department. Mm -hmm. And in southwest Ohio, all the, all the health departments regulate plumbing and it's a, it works, it's very, very good. It, it's a workable system. The building code only requires that you have potable water at the building. And the plumbing and health and sanitation does everything else. And of course, in the more rural communities where it's wells and leach beds and so on, the plumbing guys work hand in hand with the sanitarians and the health department. So, we do have uh, a couple of guys that are certified plumbing inspectors, but we just keep that for emergencies or do keep the paper. Okay. Uh, what I was going to mention is that typically everybody on council gets the email you got. Okay. One other thing I mentioned, I've got the note about be nice, then be strong. Our bias is to have people spend money on cans of paint or fixing stuff rather than on court fines or fees. However, somewhere along the way, after we've been through the whole process and we run into one or two people that are just 
not going to comply. We will probably take somebody, one or two people, to court with cases that we would view as slam dunk. Because within a community, no matter how strong the letters you write, if nobody ever, ever has a penalty for ignoring, the word gets out and the people that aren't going to bother don't bother. If word gets out that the community, the community is serious and the way they demonstrate that seriousness is by actually taking somebody into court and having some kind of penalty associated with it, word gets out and you never know how many people are now going to comply simply because they know that so-and-so in the corner uh, actually got taken to court. The reality is within the legal system, nobody makes a career as a prosecutor of property maintenance. It doesn't have the appeal of murders, rapes, and anything else. But the mere fact of using the court system occasionally tends to add strength to the efforts. And I like the kind of three strikes that you said, the friendly caution, the notice, and then third is your, your third strike, and you're gonna pay a fine if it's the third time. You 